Okay, so we're back. Um, okay, we're talking about centralized worship. So centralized means a place, and the place was the temple. So if the only place to really be emo is a certain place, right? You have to go to Jerusalem and be emo in the temple, and you're not really emo if you don't meet in the temple. What happens when the temple is gone? You know, Jesus predicted, and many others predicted, that the destruction, if the temple was ever destroyed, it would be very important in the history of the Jewish people. And it, right. would, it would basically mean the end of the world was coming. You know, Jesus said, in his prediction of the temple, he said, uh, of the temple being destroyed, he said, just pray that it doesn't happen in winter, because you're going to have a hard time whenever you see the armies coming onto Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus was a first century historian. He said that the blood was so deep that it reached a horse's bridle. You know, that the, the horse's mouth is how, how, uh, how much blood that there was. He also said that Romans were testing their swords in the corpses of dead people. Do you know what testing the sword means? Testing the sharpness. Yeah, testing the sharpness of their swords by stabbing the dead bodies. Um, it's actually one of the most moving uh, pieces of literature about war uh, in the ancient world. So the destruction of Jerusalem is very, very significant because, this is another thing to write down, I think, because Christianity was one of the things that came out of that. Because Christianity is one, one way for Judaism to survive the destruction of the temple. You know, the destruction of the temple means they can no longer follow the law of Moses. And you know that, and we're going to talk about this a lot later, um, Christians don't follow the law of Moses, right? I mean, we don't have to make sacrifices. We don't, ha we don't um, have to eat kosher. You know what kosher means? It's like certain foods uh, Jews cannot eat, like, like pork. You know, surely you've heard that Jews don't eat, Jews don't eat pork. And uh, they're... They can't eat anything that's been strangled. I mean, it's really weird, but... Well, it, it was a popular way. Uh, strangulation is an important way in the ancient world to kill something because the flavor of your meat comes from the blood, and Jews aren't allowed to eat blood. So they, the uh, ancient people would strangle stuff like like whenever you kill a chicken you uh, very popular ways to break their neck you know they would grab, it the grab both necks swing it around like this and that's how you break the break the necks of the chicken oh and the meat tastes better if the blood is in it uh, the blood is what gives it flavor if you eat a rare steak uh, you know and there's certain parts of the of the uh, of the animal that they don't eat like they don't eat filet mignon because it's at a joint at, a meat right around a joint. So there are, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, there are a lot of little things about the Jewish diet that's very distinct. And Christians don't have to follow that. You know, that's, that's a big deal in the New Testament because Jews and Christians were trying to eat together. You know, that was like, you know, the Lord's Supper is central to worship. And Jews eat one thing and Gentiles eat something else. So the Jews would sit at one table and the Gentiles would sit at another table. Or, more than likely, the Gentiles had to eat outside because in, in kosher law, the food is unclean if you have a Gentile even in the house. So, I mean, it goes like that far. So it, it was an important thing about Jewish, uh, Jewish and Christian worship. But anyway, the temple gets destroyed, and Christianity is one thing that came out of that because it was a way to preserve Jewish heritage without... Yeah. Having the temple. Okay. Destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Centralized worship synagogue and destruction of Jerusalem, which led to. Well, there's and there's another thing that happened. There, you know, Christianity was one thing, and the other thing was focus on the synagogues. You know, now that the now that the temple is gone, the Jews started worshiping more in synagogues, and so in the second century, you know, this happened in the first century, you know, 70 AD. Um, God, I can't see my notes. Um, okay, it happened in 70 AD. And after that, 
you, you started seeing synagogues pop up, like actual buildings, because Jews needed a place to worship all, the, all around the Roman Empire. Okay, so number two, reign of Titus, Domitian, Trajan, Severus, Decius, and the Clitian. Do you know the significance yeah. of those? They all persecuted Christians. They persecuted Christians. And that's the only thing you need to know about them. So during this time, and this is really important when we get to later things, um, these guys persecuted Christians, and they persecuted them in various ways. Stoning, hanging, mm -hmm. chopping off their heads. The, the very first one happened in 90 AD with Pliny the Younger. Uh, he was a governor in Valentia, which is in Greece. And he captured a Christian slave and tortured her, found out where the other Christians were, and um, interrogated them. And he, had, he did something really curious. Uh, we know, and we know this because he wrote to the emperor Trajan, who is listed here. Um, he wrote to him and said, hey, I'm persecuting Christians and this is how I'm doing it. What do you think? So he wrote a letter to him. He ca captured two. We have two ladies here. He tortured both of them really? uh, and found out where the Christians were. So the test was, the trial, um, he put out a sacrifice in front of them. You know, uh, it, he, they had to sacrifice to the emperor, you know, emperors were worshipped, uh, if they wanted to live. And he wrote in his letter, he said, no Christian can do that. They had to deny Christ three times and make a sacrifice to the emperor if they wanted to live. So a lot of the Christians didn't, some of the Christians did. Aww. So in the New Testament, we have an issue with Peter. Do you remember what happened with Peter? Yes. He denied Jesus three times, and then he was admitted. He, he uh, said he loved Jesus three times. The early Christians had to address this problem of people um, denying Jesus and you know what are we going to do to them because some people survived like let's say that that Meg you got captured you denied Christ to save yourself you made the sacrifice what now where do you go like if your whole family is Christian you can either live out on the street or you can try to get back into the church and Christian churches came down very hard on some of these people, and they wouldn't let them back in the community. Um, and then others forgave them and accepted them in the community. And both of those are reflected in the New Testament, uh, because the New Testament was written after the fall of the temple. Uh, at least uh, everything uh, after Mark. Mark is the only gospel that uh, people think, you know, New Testament scholars think was written before the destruction of the temple. And then after the destruction of the temple, we have uh, Titus is the one that destroyed the temple, the first one. And then you have Domitian, Trajan, Severus, Decius, and Delictician. And all of these, they, they are within 60 years. You know, this is very, a very small slice of Roman history. You know, it's not like this is a 100-year period or a 200-year period. This is all in the earliest stages of Christianity when the New Testament was still being written. So... Uh, the persecution of Christians, you do need to know that the story about um, Pliny the Younger capturing, you know, capturing Christians and torturing them. And Trajan said, yes, this is what you need to do. We need to get rid of Christianity. So um, the Romans actually, uh, the prob their problem with Christianity was that Christian Christianity was seen as a new religion. Um, most Romans, you know, as a historian, uh, we say, historians say, that uh, most Romans couldn't tell the difference between Christians and Judaism. You know, they just understood Christianity is a sect of Judaism. You know, they're just weirdos, weird Jews. But who persecuted him first? What's his name? Um, Pliny the Younger, and that's I'll write on the board. Uh, he's called the Younger Pliny because his uncle is, is, was older. He came before him, had the same name, and he also wrote uh, books. 
Pliny the Younger. And he wrote his he wrote the letter to Trajan, who is listed in your in your book. And he was writing in about uh, 90 CE. And that was uh, what's that? So Trajan said good job? Yeah, Trajan wrote a letter back to him commending him for uh, what he was doing with the Christians. Many of the other 12 Christians, Trajan approved. Exactly. So, and it's interesting that he was torturing female slaves. But um, plenty, you know, Roman citizens had rights. You know, so, uh, slaves didn't. And that's what concerned Pliny. You know, he's like, is it okay that if somebody's a Roman citizen and they they follow this, am I am I following following your will uh, regarding that? So, okay, um, we got that. Reign of Titus, Domitian, Trajan, Severus, Decius, Diletitian, persecutors of Christians. So this is a period that historians refer to as. Um, like the legal persecution of Christians, like it was a pro, it was like pr a program that the Romans did. You know, it was actually like systematic persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Um, and the the problem with Romans that Romans had with Christians were uh, Christianity was a new religion. Uh, Christians met in secret, which which caused Romans to be very skeptical about what was going on. So there was a lot of polemic literature. Do you all know what polemic means? Mm -hmm. Polemic is a tax. You, have you ever heard of people making fun of other people just because they don't understand what's going on? Yeah. The Romans had um, you know, literature written against Christianity. There's not a whole lot of it. There's probably five or six books that were written that we have that were written against Christians. Um, they thought that Christians were sacrificing babies sacrificing and eating babies. Um, and some of that comes from, uh, that's just how, just a common attack that people had back then. Um, and, but Christians had the weird practice of eating and drinking the blood of their God. You know, the, uh, the Eucharist was something that captured the Roman, the Roman imagination. And because Christians met in secret and were kind of weird, uh, and really, because we were a new religion, they, when they started viewing Christianity as a new religion, that's where they got suspicious. Um, the Romans valued and tolerated many religions that, were, that they thought were old. But if it was something new, they were very skeptical of it. So they thought that you know Christians were practicing all kinds of deviant stuff, like sexual stuff and eating babies, all that kind of stuff. So that's why they could kill them. Okay. So you kill babies. Yeah, it's strange to us, but um, actually, that's a con it's a convention of ancient writing. Like it's a it's a it was a common accusation. Does that make sense? Like if you just like say you were a person writing in the ancient world and you didn't like bakers, you know, you'd say, "Well, bakers eating babies," you know. Those baby eating fools. So, okay, this is kind of like criticizing somebody for greed, you know? Like, they're just greedy. So, okay, number three, monastic monasticism formed in 269. What's the significance of that, Meg? Monastery to Christian, monastery, Christian monks, um, Christianity spreads. Christianity spreads. Okay, Christianity is an urban religion. Christianity is urban religion. Okay, you need to write that down. Urban religion. Do y'all know what urban means? City. City. Okay. So you know that if you look, if you think about the letters of Paul, it's always the name of a city. You know, you got Philippians. That's to Philippi. Colossians. That's to Colossae. It's a city. Ephesians to Ephesus. Um, what's the other ones? Uh, Philemon is to a person. Uh, Corinthians, that's Corinth. And then in Revelation, you have seven cities, seven churches. Yeah, so, and you have the church in Rome. You know, you have all these cities, and uh, churches thrive there. You know, there's, re there's several reasons why Christianity 
throughout the cities, and it's where people lived, you know. But a whole lot of the population did live out in the country. But Christianity is an urban religion. Now, what do you have in the city? You have all the sins of the city. You know, the, uh, the bathhouse where everybody's naked together. And you have the brothels where all the sex is going on. You have the bars. You have, you know, all the bad stuff. So Christians in the mid-third uh, century, you understand third century is the 200s, right? Uh, Christianity uh, wanted to get out of the city. You know, a lot of Christians wanted to avoid the sin in the city. So they developed monasteries, which are uh, buildings or houses outside the city. Yeah, out the country. Yeah, and they monks. So the bad side of that is uh, a lot of the Christians got secluded. You know, they started living in, in these monasteries, and uh, they preserved a type of pure Christianity, but they were no longer missionary. They no longer went out and shared the faith. So it stinted Christian growth a little bit. And that the monasteries are where we get the New Testament from. Like they, they just sat around all day and copied the New Testament. So we got we got copies and copies and copies and copies of the New Testament. This is you know, what are you gonna do in the monastery? You know? You can't do all the fun stuff that you did in the city. But this is where we get the term. Because Christianity is an urban religion, we have terms like pagan. Do you know what pagan is? Pagan is is um, my word pagan, it's a common person. Uh-huh. Pagan and heathen, they both mean, they both come from terms in Latin or in Greek that mean like a redneck or a, or a hillbilly. These are the people out in the countryside that don't have Christianity. That's where we get those, those terms from. So they're like, whatever, they're, uh, Christians were attacking each other, and they were saying, you know, you're just a, you're just a heathen. You're just you're just worshiping a god from the countryside, not the city god. So that's where we get those. That's where we get those terms. So monasticism founded in 269. Um, Roman Empire splits in 286. Do you... 476. Oh no, 286. Yeah, 286. That's, that's 286 later. Isn't it? Okay. okay, Kaylee, do you know do you know the significance of the Roman Empire splitting? Um, it made the world, the empire weak, and it led to destruction. It made the empire weak. Do you know how? You know how it made the empire weak? Um, they were divided. They're divided, and you know Abraham Lincoln, big smart man that he was, a house divided against itself will not stand. You know you can't divide the Roman Empire, and and the it was Deletitian. Dela you know if you scroll, if you go up a little bit, uh, number two. This, this last guy, Delphician, he was the guy that came up with the bright idea of splitting the Roman Empire, having a Western Empire and an Eastern Empire. And the Eastern would be uh, controlled by uh, Constantinople, which would, back then was called Byzantine. And the West would be controlled by Rome still. And he initiated a program, or an incentive program, for senators to move from Rome to Constantinople. You know, he's offering money and more land and titles and stuff like that in the East. And do you know what the Roman Senate said to him? They stick it where the sun, the sun don't shine. I ain't leaving Rome. They were, they were very much against the idea of moving to Byzantium. Now, some of them did benefit greatly from moving, but if you have your, your you know, your ancient family you know, elite family, uh, all of your ancestors are buried in Rome, uh, and you've worked very hard to preserve your lands with all the Roman civil wars and all the different um, dictators that passed through, you're not going to want to leave. So there was a big power struggle that lasted for centuries uh, trying to get uh, the Roman aristocracy to actually move to Byzantium and uh, eventually it failed. So you're right, the Roman Empire splits to, in 286. That's the, that's the beginning of the end for the Romans. Okay, the significance of the reign of Constantine and Licinius. Um, Hang on, let's get the case. Empire and the Roman Empire. 
Uh huh. So the first question um, Pat, was there a Christian persecution? It made Christianity the official religion of Rome. Yep. And it was the end of the Edict of Milan, 313. So it's extremely significant that uh, Constantine became a Christian and his. Um, the sincerity or the, the genuineness of his conversion is questioned. You know, he finally was baptized on his deathbed, but he oversaw the Council of Nicaea before then, and he had a very famous Christian bishop called Ambrose. And I'll write that down on the board. Ambrose, St. Ambrose, uh, advised Constantine on the nature of Christianity, and um, Constantine wanted Christians to all teach the same thing, which of course Christians, you know, everywhere you go, Christians were teaching different things. So uh, Constantine put together a meeting of all the Christian bishops at the resort town of Nicaea, which is the next thing on the list, number six. First Council of Nicaea, 325, it was a resort town, uh, Constantine's, Constantine funded all the bishops, you know, he paid for their trip, and so the bishops showed up and they hammered out the, what, Nicene Creed. And so the Christians unified um, on the Nicene Creed, and Constantine himself oversaw everything. So people that criticize Christianity, you know, like, you know, I hope you understand this, uh, Christian Christianity as a new religion, it needs historic historical value. Like, we have to come from somewhere in history. And the Nicene Creed is something that people use to question our question the validity of Christianity. I mean, this is where the doctrine of the Trinity comes from. Is the, uh, and you know, the Trinity teaches that God is fully human and fully man. And Christians have been debating that for 300 years when we finally get to uh, Nicaea. Uh, because they did not agree, Constantine wanted to get them together. He oversaw everything. So the criticism is, um, is Christianity a valid religion if a Roman emperor had the final say on the first confession of Christianity? What do you think, Meg? Yeah. No. What do you think? I think the people should be allowed to decide what they So, do you think that it's important or a threat to Christianity that a Roman Empire, a Roman emperor, oversaw the First Council? Yes. What, what do you think the significance is? Well, the significance would be. Um, so Constantine presided, he was converted to Christianity. He already. So he probably would have definitely made it Christianity. But he also was not yet baptized whenever this happened. So he wasn't like a full fledged Christian. But uh, the fact of the matter is, the uh, when the Christians got together, the bishops actually had the, the final say in everything. Constantine just wanted them to, to agree on something. He really didn't care what they agreed on. So that's what we produced. Council Nicaea is satisfied. It satisfied uh, Constantine. And then, beautiful number seven, we get to St. Augustine, his conversion to Christianity. And what's the significance of that, Meg? Uh, justification by faith and developed and clarified by Paul. Exactly. His doctrine of, he expanded and clarified the doctrine of justification by faith. And you also need to know, if you don't know already, I think you do. Um, he is the most important writer in Christianity and Christian yeah, history. Uh huh. Well, if we don't count Paul and Jesus, um, Constantine is the most, I mean, Augustine is the most influential Christian writer. Um, his doctrine of justification by faith, the way he clarified Paul, that's where we get the Reformation from. And we're going to talk about the, the doctor. Doctrine of Justification by Faith uh, later in the, in the lecture, but we would not have the Reformation if we didn't have Augustine. And you know, or you should know, remember, that 
Um, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. He was raised in the faith of the Augustine, Augustinian tradition that valued justification by faith. And it was the doctrine of justification by faith that he used to justify splitting with the Roman Catholic Church. So we have the conversion to Christianity, uh, which justification by faith, uh, clarifying Paul, and then St. Jerome completes the Vulgate. What's the Vulgate, Kaylee? It's the uh, Latin translation of the Bible. Latin translation of the Bible. Why is that important? Um, because it's still a like, actual um, translation. Still the official translation of the Roman Catholic Church. This is where we get the final say on Roman Catholic theology that comes from Scripture. Um, it's also significant because people were speaking Latin. You know, Latin was the lingua franca still. You know, to, to uh, that's a pun, actually. Okay, lingua franca. Okay, we got four or five? Hour 45. Okay. And then you got the Council of Chalcedon in 451, which uh, clarified and expanded the Nicene Creed. Added the Nicene Creed, clarified and developed. Yep. Clarified and developed the Nicene Creed. So there were still questions, even after Nicaea, people were still thinking about and clarifying the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's a, it's a clarification on the doctrine of the Trinity. And then we have the Western Empire ends in 476. They could not withstand the, um, the barbarian horde. Yeah, ended by 